Hey, good morning. It's Patricia Murphy. It's Wednesday. This is Seattle Now. We started this podcast two years ago, pretty much the same time we all started living in a pandemic. Today, on our 500th show, we'll reflect on it all with the very first person we ever talked to, infectious disease specialist Dr. Clyde Crumpecker. But first, let's get you caught up. A legal blow for the state's new capital gains tax passed last year. A Douglas County judge sided with opponents yesterday and declared the new tax unconstitutional. State AG Bob Ferguson says he'll appeal. The case could ultimately be decided by the state Supreme Court. Meanwhile, a Tacoma woman who set fire to Seattle police vehicles during the 2020 protests will spend five years in prison. Margaret Channon was identified on video from her clothing and tattoos. Federal prosecutors say she burned five SPD vehicles near 6th and Pine during the city's protests for racial justice. Channon pleaded guilty in September and was sentenced yesterday. And cue the sad trombones. The commissioner of Major League Baseball has canceled the first two series of the upcoming season after labor talks failed. That means the Mariners won't start off against the Tigers and Angels this year. Right now, they'd start the season on April 7th against the Twins. But NPR reports that there are still huge gaps between the owners and players, which could mean even more games scratched from the schedule. It's been two years and a pandemic since we started this podcast. We're 500 episodes in now, and it feels like a good time to just reflect a bit. Back then, we were saving N95 masks for medical workers. Today, we're pulling them out of every pocket. For many of us, the return to the office feels as weird as it did to work remotely when this all began. In 2020, when news of the first COVID cases broke, it felt surreal and scary. It was also the first episode of this show. We were really fortunate that weekend to be able to talk through what we knew with Dr. Clyde Crumpacker, an infectious disease specialist and professor of medicine at Harvard Medical School in Boston, and he also happens to be my father-in-law. Dr. Clyde, here we are two years later. So good to talk to you. Well, it's good to talk to you, Trish. So when you were last on the show, We were just seeing the first U.S. COVID cases at Life Care Center in Kirkland out here and the first recorded deaths in the U.S. from the virus. Man, it was an incredible time, wasn't it? It was remarkable. And and as you rightly point out, it it sort of began in the state of Washington, in Seattle. And uh, it's been a remarkable two years. And it's in some ways we're getting some hopeful signs that at least the current outbreak is uh, decreasing worldwide. Yeah, yeah. And back then, when we talked to you in March 2020, the discussion was about what infectious disease experts were looking out for. Let's listen to what you said from that interview two years ago. Well, I think this next week is going to be a very important week. The numbers are uh, definitely increasing. And I think the expectation is after a week, uh, my guess is there might be 200 cases confirmed in the United States. I cannot believe the depth and magnitude we were talking about with only 200 cases at that time, Clyde. It's really something because it seemed so large at the time. Yes, it did seem like a large number back then. But as we all know, it's remarkable how much this has become a major health problem in our country. With over 6 million cases, 980,000, close to be a million deaths, the vaccines have been a tremendous accomplishment, but we and the whole world didn't know what we were in for. It's incredible. And uh, And the scientific community, I think, has just worldwide has reacted with tremendous collegiality and working together. It was uh, January 10th, 2020, when China, the lab in Wuhan, published the sequence of the virus, the whole sequence. That was a Friday afternoon. So I know three labs, our lab at Beth Israel Deaconess, where Dr. Dan Baruch was the head of it, was one. And then Pfizer and Moderna worked all weekend. They worked around the clock, and by Monday... All three of them had candidate vaccines, which was remarkable. And by March, they were ready to begin vaccine trials. That's just incredible. 
I do want to talk a little bit about vaccines because the fact that we were able to develop this series of vaccines so quickly really says a lot about what we can do collectively if we put our mind to it. Yes, it absolutely does. This is a remarkable accomplishment from modern molecular biology and modern science that who knew that mRNA-based vaccines could be made so quickly and, and would provide such protection against serious disease and hospitalization. Now, they don't prevent 100% from getting infected. And as we know, even the Queen of England can, can get infected. But they have provided real protection against serious illness and death, for sure. Clyde, what might this advancement and collective effort with vaccines how might that impact other diseases? Well, I think it's going to have a, a tremendous possible application. And now, for example, if we just take AIDS, there are still estimated maybe 35 million people infected with the HIV virus. They take antiviral drugs. They can live pretty much a normal life, but it's not a cure. But now Moderna is adapting their mRNA vaccine strategy to see if they can make it a vaccine against HIV. Now, it's been very hard to get a vaccine against HIV, but it's, here's an example. Maybe this mRNA technology can provide a real breakthrough, and people who are infected or exposed to HIV might be able to benefit from a vaccine using this whole different technology. And indeed, doctors at Walter Reed Medical Center are, are leading the way in perhaps working on a universal vaccine that would be a preventative against all the different strains. So you could take this and you wouldn't have to take a different one for each strain, but you'd get a broad spectrum protection from an antibody that developed by the vaccine that they're working on at Walter Reed. You know, vaccines obviously have let us get to this point, Clyde, and it feels like we are moving in the right direction now. The CDC is rolling back mask requirements. How are you thinking about the pandemic right now? Where are we in this thing from the Clyde Crumpacker perspective? Well, uh, thank you. It's a, it's a very good question. <laughs> First of all, I, I do feel a sense of cautious relief that we've come through a, a tremendous challenge with the Omicron strain and the vaccines have worked against that. And now we're rightfully easing up on mask restrictions and kids are going to be able to go back to school without masks. But I think we're not over this yet, but I think we're over what has been the most highly transmissible strain that we've, we've seen. So that's a sense of relief. So I, I think that we have got to keep a, a sharp eye out for maybe new strains developing. The ability to sequence viruses, the ability of laboratories all over the world, and in many ways being led by South Africa, to rapidly sequence new agents and identify them has also been a tremendous milestone. And been pushed by the whole COVID epidemic. The other thing I wanted to talk about that you brought up, Clyde, is the sequencing of the virus. Given that it is likely that there will be another variant coming down the line, are we in a position to sequence the virus quickly enough to figure out what we need to be doing? Do we have enough tracking, virus tracking at this point, to be nimble? Well, I think we're doing a lot better than certainly we did under the Trump administration. The CDC at the end of the Trump administration was in a very bad way. It could not detect new virus strains, but they've made a real effort uh, under Dr. Walensky's leadership to greatly expand their ability to sequence uh, all over the country, and, and we're getting better and, and better at it. There are some places like South Africa that are able to do this in much better than we have done. And we're learning a lot from them. How, the, how do they do this so quickly to detect new strains? So I would say, yes, we do have a considerable capacity now to pick up new strains if they occur. And we're constantly trying to increase that and make it even better. Fascinating, Clyde. Is it likely that there will be another variant down the pike that's going to knock us back like Omicron did? Well, there's a lot of debate about that. I think certainly we are going to see other variants, but maybe nothing quite like o Omicron, because a large population of the developed world certainly is, is vaccinated. 
Um, but the hope is that with the vaccination and, and particularly getting boosters, which greatly increase protective antibody against all strains, that we're going to have much more protection if a new variant, hopefully not as transmissible as Omicron, comes along and, and we'll have a lot more protection. Really appreciate that tempered message, Dr. Clyde, as we emerge back into our new normal. Thank you so much for taking the time. I really appreciate talking to you. I'm so lucky to have you as my father-in-law. Well, it's been great to talk to you, and I would just finish by saying the world has come through a lot together. We've learned an awful lot. I'm glad there is a sign of improvement all around the world, but we can't let our guard down completely. We have to keep using their ability to detect new strains and and trying to improve our treatments and bet making better vaccines. Dr. Clyde Crumpacker, infectious disease specialist and professor of medicine at Harvard Medical School in Boston. Thank you for helping us reflect on two years of the pandemic on Seattle Now. Thank you very much, Trish. Appreciate you listening. And if you've been with us from the beginning, thanks for going on the journey. We have covered a lot of ground. Really glad you're here. Jenny Cecil Moore produced today's show. Matt Jorgensen does our theme music. I'm Patricia Murphy. See you tomorrow. 